Thank you so much, Margaret, for reading that so beautifully for us. Um, so let's just pray. Father in heaven, thank you uh, again for your word. Thank you for uh, bringing it to us. And uh, Father, as we reflect on this passage this evening, Lord, speak to us. Speak to us afresh. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So just by way of introduction, um, or a recap if you like, um, obviously this book written by Peter, the key's in the name, it's um, uh, uh, 1 Peter. Um, some scholars dispute it, but actually there are distinctives in this book, they're very characteristic of, of Peter. I think in particular the fact that Peter is able to describe so clearly uh, the suffering of Christ and um, you know, that passage towards the end there, that's very characteristic of, of, of what we know of Peter's life. Peter was there in the courtyard. He witnessed these things. So he was an eyewitness of the account uh, which he described. The book, uh, just again by way of a recap, book um, is written to um, the diaspora, is written to the scattered people of God in five different regions in modern day Turkey. And uh, again, there's a, there's a bit of debate about uh, was it written to Jews, uh, who'd become Christians, or was it written to Gentiles who'd become Christians? And you might think, oh, yeah, that's a bit of an academic debate, but actually it has significance for the way we read one of the passages later. So I, I might come back to that. Um, another point to note is, is about the time and uh, who the emperor is. So the passage m mentions the emperor. Uh, the emperor at the time was Nero. Nero was a tyrant, and uh, particularly... Um, uh, so a, a, a wicked, <laughs> uh, a wicked tyrant. Um, he was responsible, um, uh, responsible for the burning down of a large part of Rome. He had a, uh, a desire to engage in a, a rebuilding of Rome, and he, he uh, allegedly he uh, was responsible for burning down round about three quarters of Rome around about this time. So it was around about uh, AD 64. When he did that, um, people started turning their attention to him and blaming him for it. And what he did, um, he turned the attention to Christians and he blamed the Christians for the, for the fire in Rome. So that's the backdrop for this letter. And when he turned their uh, attention to Christians, that's when the persecution broke out. Some of the acts he committed against Christians were unspeakable. I won't mention them here. Um, but the, the, there was an appalling uh, amount of persecution that broke out as a result of his actions. So how might we apply um, th this letter to us? Because a lot of the, a lot of the letter is about persecution. Uh, we live in, a, in the UK largely in a, fr in a free country. Um, we don't face, generally speaking, we don't face persecution. But actually, I think it has a lot to say to us about hardship, about how we face hardship, and uh, in particular, the, the idea of patiently enduring hardship whenever we face it. So, I'd um, like to just structure the um, sermon today just on, on a, a couple of verses uh, across three different points. First, he's sort of a holy people, looking at verses one to three. Then the and I'm going to look at the living stone section, the middle section, verses 4 to 10. And then think um, towards the end something about our relationship with the world. And in particular, how Peter talks about submission to authorities and what we might take from that today. So, so that's by way of background. The very first word in chapter 2, which we're looking at today, is the word... Anybody know? Therefore. So... Uh, uh, um, might want to ask the question when you see the word therefore what is it therefore what, what, what precedes this that um, the motions Peter to use the word therefore and the three reasons where he might, um, he might use the word therefore he might be uh, going back to chapter 1 where he says be holy as I am holy so he's quoting from Le Leviticus 11 um, uh, 44 be holy as I am holy so on the one hand uh, there's the command to be holy and then Peter's saying, actually, now live out that holy, live out the holiness by ridding yourself of these things. And there's a sin list um, we, we see uh, in verse 1. 
Um, so that's one possibility. Another is where Peter talks about uh, love. And he talks in chapter one, he talks about loving each other. Um, after you purified yourselves by obeying the truth, love one another deeply. Therefore, rid yourself of these sins. So in other words, it's tied up with love. What does love look like? It includes ridding ourselves of the things that get in the way of love in, as we relate to one another. And there's a third possibility as well. Um, and that's uh, toward the end of chapter one. It, uh, Peter talks about uh, you being born again of imperishable seed. So you've been born again through the word of God. Therefore, continue in the word of God. And part of that is to rid yourself of these things. So three possibilities. Any of those could be true. Um, I, I think it's, it's helpful just to recognize the, f the flow of thought from chapter 1 and chapter 2. So, rid yourself. Um, have, we, have we got it on the slide? Yep. Therefore, rid yourself. I can't sit on there. See? Is, that, is that a possibility, Bill? Thanks. Um, thanks very much. Uh, rid yourself, I'll just turn around so I can see it, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy and slander of every kind. Um, there's very similar t terminology elsewhere in scriptures to this idea of ridding ourselves. Um, so in Ephesians, Paul uses a similar idea. Um, you are taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, to be made new in the attitudes of your minds and to put on uh, the new self. So put off, put on, with being made new in the middle. Um, and then in Philippines, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to accomplish his, his, his purpose. So similar term, terminology, this idea of ridding ourselves of these things which, which get in the way of us living as God wants us to. So what do those comparisons tell us? I think firstly, that there is something that we need to do. There isn't, you don't get a sense from this verse, uh, it's a let go and let God. In other words, uh, we, we have an active part to play in having character um, form within us. It's a partnership with the Holy Spirit, but we have an active part to play. One writer um, actually takes that further. He says, um, sometimes when we talk about wrestling with sin, when we talk about wrestling with sin, we talk... We quite often use the terminology, uh, I, I, I'm looking to get victory over this particular sin in my life. And he says, actually, what that does is it, is it, is it puts the emphasis back on someone else. In other words, he, he prefers to use the terminology, I'm trying to get obedience in this area of my life. And it's just a subtle thing, but, it, but I think the important thing to take away is we have a shared responsibility, God working in us, to will and act according to his purpose, but we have a responsibility to put off. So how do we respond to what, when we look at a list like this in, in verse, uh, verses one and two? Um, do, do, you know, one of the dangers is we, we become introspective. We, we look within ourselves and um, we, we look to uh, the errors we've made, the sins we've made, and maybe there's a place for that but I, I, I like the emphasis we see in, uh, in the Psalms, uh, Psalm 100 and, um, 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me, know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. But, so it's that idea of it's inviting God by his Holy Spirit to search our hearts. And I think it's a really healthy, helpful place to be. Uh, allowing the Holy Spirit to bring things to the surface. Yes, you need Pete, you need to look at this. Uh, have you thought about this, uh, and so on. Do you remember the time when, um, in, in the Gospels, where the rich young ruler goes to Jesus and he says, um, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, yeah, you know the commandments, and he lists the commandments, and, he, and his response is, all these I've kept since I was a boy. So he had his list, he had his list, almost a tick list. Um, and what, does, what does Jesus do in response to that? He actually invites him on a journey. And I think when we look at a list like this, we can look at it as a tick list. You think, okay, I'm, I'm pretty good on that one, not, not so good on that one, whatever. 
And, and I don't think that's the invitation here. I think the invitation is actually to, to, be, to go on a journey with Jesus. Uh, he invites us to journey with him just as he did that rich young ruler. So, next verse, crave pure spiritual milk. What, uh, what I'm going to do just through this, this talk is I'm just going to step through a couple of the key verses. Not every verse, but just a couple of the key verses. So that's uh, the idea. Crave pure spiritual milk. This, this is particularly pertinent to us. We became grandparents about uh, three or four months ago. And we have a, a beautiful uh, baby daughter. I'm not, I'm not going to picture of her today, but a beautiful baby daughter, uh, granddaughter. And she craves milk. Uh, so probably every, certainly when she was first born, every two to three hours. So it's, it's feed, sleep, um, um, cry a bit, feed, sleep, cry a bit. And it was, it was sort of a three-hour cycle. And I'd forgotten what that was like. Um, but it's just that idea, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk. And I think the thing is here, um, it would be wrong to infer that... Um, yeah, uh, Peter uses the idea of, of newborn babes. It's not something we graduate from. And I think, I think the idea in Scripture is actually that this is continual nourishment. He wants, he wants us to identify with the idea of craving, but that for to be an ongoing pattern in our lives as Christians. So uh, elsewhere the, um, in Hebrews, there's a similar idea um, where the writer of Hebrews says you need milk not solid food, um, and then he goes on talking about solid food for the, mat for the mature. So you might think, okay, well, uh, do, we, do we graduate from milk to solid food? But I, th I think we can't mix these two metaphors. Uh, so I think the one in Hebrews is talking about the depth of our intake of the word. So I, I, well, we're wrestling with different ideas, different um, understandings of scripture. It's still the scripture is our source, and it, it, it gives life to us uh, through the Holy Spirit, teaches us, directs us, and so on. Um, but I think the, the key point I want to, uh, to draw from this is, is that that craving, that desire for God's word is not something we graduate from. It's something that, is, that God plants within us and is, is to be our guiding light throughout our, our lives. <clears throat> so how, what, what means are there of taking in God's word? Um, I had a list of five, and I've added one. Um, so, so there's hearing. You hear the, hear the word of God. You hear the word of God preach. You hear the word of God spoken. You can have David Suchet uh, through a podcast if you want, reading God's word to you. There are various alternatives like that. You can read it. Uh, you can just read it like a book um, and, and, and ingest it that way. You can study it in the, through our different um, community groups and fellowship groups we have. You can memorize it. Um, I'm, I'm super keen on memorizing. I, I find it really helpful. If, if you had asked me to, um, to swap memorizing scripture for years in Bible college, I'd probably tick memorizing scripture because I, in, in terms of um, help in, in, in seeing the word of God in you, shape your life, shape your convictions, um, I found that really helpful. And you, if you want to do that, you can just start small. You know, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Most of us will know that. Well, that's a quarter of, of Psalm 121 uh, straight away. So if you wanted to do that and form a pattern uh, in your life of, if, if you don't do this already, of memorizing, just start with the Psalms. Start with one of the small Psalms um, and, and make it a pattern of your life. And then lastly, meditating. Uh, so meditating on scripture. So uh, what's the definition of that? So prayerful, prayerful reflection with a view to application. Meditating on scripture. And then I'll probably add another one, singing. Sometimes you get some songs that, that help us understand the word of God in a new way. Uh, I love um, songs that are based on the Psalms. Uh, the no, number of old ones, some of some new writers uh, are using them, but it's particularly helpful as well. So different ways of taking in, of craving God's word. So let's move on to the second section, uh, living stones and royal priesthood. 
uh, there's, there's a huge amount in this. I'm not really going to do this justice, but um, there's a huge amount in, in, in this. You, like living stones, are being built. Um, now, at this point in time, the temple is still in existence. Um, so the temple of Jerusalem destroyed AD 70. This is written about 64. So this is about six years before the temple was destroyed. But here we see this idea of we as, uh, as believers being built into a spiritual house. And it's as though the, uh, Peter, the writer, is talking about a new, um, a new expression, new expression, new, um, new expression of what f- a faith community might look like. So not gathered around a temple anymore, but, but a living, um, oh, uh, what's the phrase you use? Uh, living stones and a spiritual house. Now, so, in a way, this is a, this is a fulfillment of, of Jesus' words in John 4. Um, Jesus is saying to the woman at the well, you will worship neither in Jerusalem nor on this mountain. He, he foretells a time when, when this would be the case, when people wouldn't be centered around um, uh, temple worship in Jerusalem and this kind of worship, which is described in 1 Peter um, here, will be, uh, would be the norm. And then the phrase holy priesthood. So that's imported from um, Exodus 19. If you want to look back at some time, uh, Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6. Uh, and what Peter does is he takes an Old Testament verse and he applies it to the, the, the New Testament church, uh, church of Jesus. And it's as though he's saying that we all now have access to God. So in the same way that people in, in the Old Testament had access to God, there it was mediated. Here now we have access to God through Jesus. Um, so he's applying the Old Testament verse. And it's interesting, he, he doesn't, um, uh, w- w- in a moment we'll come on to the verses about um, submission to authorities. He, 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 what he, he does is he reminds people of their status, their standing before God, that um, they are uh, living stones, a royal priesthood or a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices. He reminds them of their standing before God and that then is the basis on which they submit to authorities. And I, I think this, this passage here is placed here purposely just to remind people of their standing and sometimes it's, it's much easier to live out d- difficult and challenging um, commands in scripture if we do it from a basis of who we are in Christ, uh, of our standing before God. And I think that's what Peter's doing here, is reminding them of of their position. The one who trusts in him will never be put to, will never be put to shame. Just think about this issue of of trust. uh, Trust is, is something we can learn uh, at any stage in our Christian lives, we can learn it very early on, can't we? And um, um, I, I, I love the picture in 1 Samuel 3 when um, uh, Samuel is in, the, is in the temple and he doesn't yet know the word of God, uh, but he, he's got a mentor, he's got a spiritual mentor, someone who's helping him, and that person's name is Eli. And, um, and then there's this little thing goes on, uh, you know, at night time he, he hears God's voice, doesn't recognize it as God's voice, and Eli points him to, to God. He says, go back and, and say, um, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And what I like about that story is, is that Eli has to go through a transition of depending on people to depending on God. And he had to learn it at an early age. And he, uh, learning to listen to people, but also learning to listen to the voice of God and the priority of that, of that latter one in particular. Um, I think um, the point I'd note about that is if, if we're to grow in Christian character, that can't really take place unless it's done in a dependence on God. Now, I think that's one of our values, isn't it? A dependence on God as a church. Um, so I, I think we see that here. Uh, the one who trusts in him, trusts in Jesus, will never be put to shame. And then that last verse, uh, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Uh, I think... Th- what Peter does here is he, he reminds the people um, of, about uh, an Old Testament prophecy about Christ. That 
he's writing to five scattered uh, churches or five scattered regions in modern day Turkey. And they might be, begin to, to question, well, what, what's happening here? Why isn't Jesus, why isn't Jesus as the Christ more universally acknowledged? That might be the question in their mind. And uh, particularly when persecution broke out and you weren't seeing vast numbers of Jews become Christians, we were seeing some, but not, not, not the number, um, it wasn't universal. So they might have been asking that question. And what Peter does is he draws them back to the scriptures and says, actually, if you look back in scripture, Jesus was predicted, it was predicted that Jesus would be rejected and not all would acknowledge um, who he is and um, what he came to do. And I think it's similar for us as, as, as Christians in a way. Um, Jesus told a parable, um, um, uh, or the sower, but I, I think the other, the other verses uh, in, in Matthew and in the Sermon on the Mount. And you might ask the question, well, why isn't the church um, not rap expanding rapidly or society becoming more Christian? And just to remind ourselves that what Jesus says, small is the gate, narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. So it's that same idea that there will be some who will reject the message of Christ, the message of love, the message of his sacrifice. There will be some who will reject that and, and not to be you know, saddened by it, but not to be phased by it. That's, that's, that, that is um, what will happen. And then lastly, I just want to talk a little about patient endurance um, or hardship. Um, I think hardship um, gives us the opportunity to grow in character. I don't think hardship itself helps us to grow in character, but it gives us the opportunity to grow uh, in character. Um, Romans 5 verse 3, suffering produces perseverance, perseverance produces character, character, hope. Um, and I think it's as we persevere through hardship, as we patiently endure hardship, that is where character is built. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so I reflect back on my own life. I, I, I think um, I've told a number of people about this before, but 10 years ago, I was made redundant. I, I, I think probably um, in, the, in the last 10 years, that, that, that experience was really formative in my life in, in shaping conviction, but also um, I think when it happened, it came as a real shock to us as a family and it had lots of implications for us. And it re really caused us to reevaluate what we were about, what was really important to us as a family. Because um, we had to think about, well, we might need to sell our home, uh, what if I couldn't get a job and so on. So we, we went through that process and it was really formative um, uh, in our lives. And I think God sometimes um, uses circumstances like that to, to help us to think, to help form character within us if we allow it. And it's only as we reflect on it, as, we endure, as, we, as we're patiently enduring it, uh, that I think uh, some of the character benefits come. So just um, coming to land, just thinking about the example of Christ that, uh, that uh, Peter uses. Um, he committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insult at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. So the, um, what Peter's doing, is he's drawing our attention to, um, to, the, to the life of Christ and how uh, Jesus endured um, the, 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 the pain and the suffering and um, how he submitted to it in a, in a way. And that drawing out an example, um, I think especially helpful. We see it lots of times in scripture and Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians. You know, he says, um, 1 Corinthians uh, 11, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. I think we're encouraged to look at examples in Scripture, look particularly the, the example of Christ, but lots of examples, sometimes good ones, sometimes we can learn still from, from poor examples, but the Scripture's littered with lots of examples. Um, I like this little phrase uh, that was, uh, someone told me once, uh, the eye is a willing pupil, 
um, more willing than the ear. Fine counsel, often confusing, but examples always clear. Uh, a little ditty to remember. <laughs> but, um, and we see, uh, just in, uh, as I prepare for this, um, I was looking at um, uh, um, what, what different people said um, um, within the church, outside the church at the time. If you look, if you remember this book was written in AD 64. Go, uh, go on uh, 60, 70 years afterwards. It was 60 or 70 years ago, later when this was written. Uh, and it was written about Christians by someone called Pliny. Um, they had bound themselves with an oath. He's talking about Christians, not for any crime, but to commit neither, neither theft, nor robbery, nor adultery, nor to break their word, and not to deny deposit when demanded. So what he's, what he's doing there is he's, he's listing a set of virtues that he's seeing, that he's observing. This is someone who, I, I don't know whether Pliny was a, a Christian or not, or whether he was, a, he was a Roman historian, but he, he's writing at the time, AD 12, uh, 112, so many years later, and he's writing uh, ab about the church, the things he's observing. And I think um, when we're called to patiently endure, sometimes the fruit of that might be many years down the line, but we're still called nonetheless to patiently endure with God's strength through hardships we might face. So, so in summary, what, what, what are some possible responses um, just uh, thinking about these three areas, so a holy people, God calling us to be a holy people, and then the verses on living stones, royal priesthood, and then lastly, um, the way we relate to the world. I didn't major on that particularly, but it talks a lot about submission to authorities, submission um, uh, uh, in the context they were facing. So the, the questions I'd like to ask ourselves, is just, just to reflect on for a moment, uh, maybe we have a, a, a moment of quiet as we, uh, as we reflect on these for a, for a minute or two. So is, the, is there an area, um, ask ourselves, is there an area that the Holy Spirit is drawing our attention to with regard to our relationships with others in the church? So we're called to be a holy people. Is there something that the Holy Spirit would draw our attention to in, in the way we relate to one another? So that's the first question to ask. And then the <clears throat> second is, is something about living stones, royal priesthood. Is there something the Holy Spirit wants to draw your attention to about your standing before God and the confidence we can have in our standing before God? And then lastly, is the Holy Spirit drawing your attention to the way we conduct ourselves in the, in the world, the way we conduct ourselves in relationship with others. You see that later on in the chapter, but um, I think the heart of it is, is the way we conduct ourselves in relationship with the world. So I'm just going to have um, a short minute or two just to pause there and invite you to, to reflect on that. And maybe, Zach, if you could um, play a song after that. <clears throat>